Sirac, come on out. Hi, Sirac. Hi. What's with the sling? I broke my elbow. How did you do that? I was running on a wall in Spain. Are you in trouble for that? No. Don't run on walls in Spain. Anyway, why don't you show us how you crack your knuckles, OK? That was a lovely crunchy noise. And what's happening is that inside each of the joints of your hand, Sirac, there is a special liquid called synovial fluid. And I'll tell you what, do you both want to see what's happening inside your hands? No, no way! Look, I'm not going to actually cut your hands open. I'm just going to show you using the syringe. For you! Now, the water in this syringe represents the synovial fluid in Sirac's joints. And when he cracks them, what he's actually doing is temporarily reducing the pressure. And I can simulate that in the syringe. It's sealed at the end and no gas can get in. So if I pull it and reduce the pressure, it bubbles form. And that's because there's gas dissolved in the fluid. When you reduce the pressure, it comes out of solution. A bit like when you open the lid on a fizzy drink. And if you pull the plunger back and then release it suddenly, you get a pop when the bubbles collapse. That's called cavitation. And we think that's what's causing the noise in Sirac's joints when he pops them. Well, Sirac, you have been a brilliant knuckle cracker today, so thank you very much. Go on, off you go. Back to the cupboard. Fine, I have things to do anyway. All right, fine. Bye! Bye! So, synovial fluid might be great for making a popping sound, and it probably doesn't do the joints of your hand any harm, but it can be extremely annoying, so don't do it if someone asks you to stop unless you want to annoy someone. But the real purpose of synovial fluid is to lubricate and protect all the moving joints in your body. And in fact, it can handle a huge amount of force. So much force that we are unable to demonstrate it inside the laboratory. We are going to have to take it outside. <laughs> Come on, son, chop, chop. Now, when you do something as simple as running for a bus, your knees have to absorb a force equivalent to eight times your own body weight. Now, that might sound like a lot, but, of course, the synovial fluid in the knee absorbs the force, spreads it evenly and protects the joint. Come on, Zand. I'm coming. I can't wait to see what you're going to show me. My absolute favourite thing about synovial fluid... Wait a minute, Chris. Is that a crate? Yes. Is it a weight attached to it? Yes. Well, you don't mean... Yes. You're not going to... Yes. Wow! Now, your synovial fluid is amazing at dispersing huge amounts of force. It's like a cushion that softens the impact on joints, like your knees. And that's lucky, because when a gymnast lands... I thought I saw a gymnast back there. Yes, this is youth Olympic champion Taisha Mattis, who said she'd show us a few moves to help with our experiment. So when Taisha lands, up to 12 times her own body weight goes through her knees. And we're going to show you what that kind of force looks like by dropping a weight onto this car. Now, the weight and the distance of the car have been specially calculated to exactly represent the force that goes through Taisha's knees. But unlike Taisha, this car has no synovial fluid. Are you ready, Zan? I was born ready! This is all in the name of science. Scientific synovial fluid experiment, go! Three, two, one, drop! It's completely caved in the metal roof of the car. And that is the kind of force that your knees are protected from by the synovial fluid. But I tell you what, I'd be very interested to know the kind of forces involved if a gymnast was built, you know, more like me. Well, that's easy to do, Zan. We just need to raise the weight higher to see the greater force that would go through the knees of someone heavier. You ready? Ready. Three, Three two, two, one. Run! <laughs> Son, if you look at this broken glass, that is what the cartilage in your knees would look like if you didn't have synovial fluid and you did gymnastics. So we've shown you that knuckle cracking makes a popping noise because bubbles from your synovial fluid burst as you flex your fingers. And we've shown you that the synovial fluid has a much more important job than fun popping sounds. It helps your joints withstand the huge amounts of force you put on them every day. Well, I must say, Chris, that was absolutely excellent. And that car is completely ruined. Now, how about I give us a lift back to the lab? Chris? Chris? Zand, what are you doing? Well, 
I'm trying to write a new science book. It's all about Professor Albert Grumblestein and his quest to make a new human brain using stardust. Well, actually, Zahn, there are scientists right here on Earth who are already making human brains in labs. It's not the future, it's happening now. Where do they get their stardust from? They're not using stardust, Zahn, they're using stem cells. Time for investigation. Ouch. This is a fake brain, but we're going to show you a real human brain. Look away now if you're squeamish. Your brain is packed with a hundred billion cells called neurons. They control pretty much everything you do. The brain is such a complex organ that if something goes wrong with it, either through injury or disease, it can be very hard to fix. This is Professor Rafalov. He is exploring and developing the cutting edge technology needed to grow a human brain. But Professor Rafalov isn't looking to grow a whole brain just yet. He's investigating growing small pieces first. So the human brain is the most complicated thing we know about. Where do you even start? We need to start from stem cells. Every cell in your body begins life as a stem cell. They are like blank cells waiting to be given a job to do, whether they become hair cells, blood cells or brain cells. <laughs> Professor Rafalov has already turned these stem cells into neurons, but in order to develop them into a brain, they require a 3D support. This is a 3D nano printer. Nano means very, 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 very small. This printer can print things that are 100,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And that is pretty small. Now, what is it printing at the moment? It's a printing now 3D scaffolds for neurons to live on. This 3D scaffold is basically a frame to support the neurons and help them divide and grow. But where is it? Because I can't see anything. It is it's very small. It's just the size that's below one millimetre. You know, even if I get in really close, I cannot see what's going on. So in order to understand this brain scaffolding, we're going to have to supersize it. This is a very simple scaffolding design, similar to the one that Professor Rafaloff is using, but mine is a lot bigger. OK, and print. To show you how a neuron scaffold works, I'm using this normal 3D printer. Ten hours later, and it's cooked. My supersized scaffold is ready for some brain cells. I have some here in this aerosol can. In fact, this is expanding foam, but it represents brain cells. You can see the foam filling the spaces between the scaffold. And this is what the brain cells would be doing on Professor Rafaloff's nano version. And now the neurons can grow and connect to each other in three dimensions, just like they would in a real brain. Although I must admit, I didn't know growing a brain was going to be such a messy business. This is my version. So how much smaller is your scaffold than mine? I, I would say it's a million times smaller than what you build. You can fit a million of yours into one of mine. Yes. Professor Rafalov's may be a million times smaller, but we can take a closer look through a microscope to see how neurons develop. Now we have neurons growing on a scaffold. On a scaffold, yes. And why are they flashing? Flashing show us that neurons start to connect to each other. They just start to talk to each other. So these neurons, they're already forming a brain-like circuit. Yes. Wow! Essentially, what you've made here is the first step toward building a human brain. Yes. Can you believe that in the future, if you were to damage your brain, they might be able to mend it with something that was printed in a lab?